you so much for your goodness and your mercy. And we thank you for your presence in this place tonight. And Father, as we come together in fellowship around your word, I believe those that are within the sound of my voice, they'll be doers of your word and not just hearers only. But Father, most importantly, they'll receive a new revelation from your word tonight. Father, I know that uh, you, make, you never make things difficult. But Father, I thank you for all those that are here tonight. Father, that they're here to receive something special. Father, and as they go from this place tonight, they will be able to go in victory in Jesus' name because they will have heard that uncompromised word of God. And I praise you for all that you're doing at RLC. Father, the people coming from the north, the south, the east, and west to fill this church up. And I praise you, Father, for the yearning for us to even know you even more, Father more than ever before and we just thank you for it now in jesus name amen glory to god it's good to see everybody please uh, have a seat if you like it and, uh, the coin a coin a statement that brother bill made if you're looking for pastor i'm not him uh, he is uh obviously out to this evening but i believe he's going to be back really soon Probably be back Sunday, I bet. You know, it wouldn't surprise me any. Amen. Well, um, Pastor had asked me uh, earlier, I guess I guess it was actually it was on Sunday morning he had asked me if I could take some time to prepare and <clears throat> um, just present for you tonight. And uh, obviously, you know, whenever Pastor comes to you and asks to teach or minister or whatever, you know, does anybody ever say no? At least you're going to do whatever you're being asked to do. And, and uh, I first thought, yeah, I'll be glad to, Pastor, until I got home. And then I thought, well, Pastor, do you know um, what I got going on? I came up with all these excuses why I can't get ready and get prepared for tonight. And then, uh, of course, I got the spiritual spanking, like most of us do. And the Lord just said, you know, you just need to calm down and do what the Pastor told you to do. And he said, well... I said, well, look, look, I, I said, I'm a, I'm a little unclear right now what he told me because I, I was so shocked that he asked me at the time. I'm not sure what he told me. He said, he said, just talk about faith. And, and I said, well, Lord, I need to understand why. And as we were, uh, as I was praying through it, you know, the pastor over the last few weeks has been uh, teaching us and talking to us about the up and coming revival. But most importantly, there's a key part, and I don't know if you've heard it or not, he's talking about the importance of how much you need to build up your faith. Because in our faith in these last days are going to be the key to get us through to victory. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And so you would say, well, no, it's going to be another faith message. Well, you know what? I don't know about y'all know this couple here and some others. We've sat under Dr. Hagen for so long, that's all he ever talked about was faith. And as far as I'm concerned, you can't get enough about it. Amen. Because we probably haven't, none of us arrived at all. Amen. Amen. But, <clears throat> what I'm, so what I'm going to be teaching, or at least, at least showing you more so tonight, is uh, we're going to talk about uh, great faith. And there's only two accounts in the Bible that I was able to study through that talks about great faith. But... What I want to be able to do is kind of draw your attention to not only just great faith, but just faith in general and how important it is that the things have been laid out before us are ready. It's just up to us to start operating and working in it. Amen? So God is good. But first, first and foremost, as most of you probably already know, if you would turn to Ephesians chapter 1. <clears throat> Ephesians is uh, very important for me because that's typically where I'll start a lot of times, on, especially on Wednesdays or teaching. God is so good. I just need to tell you something. I know this is going to be good. It's probably going to be better than I even think it's going to be. Because if I went by my feelings, I wouldn't be here right now. Um, I, 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 uh, I, I, I had such a great opportunity to just, um, 
he challenged by the enemy today. Not because of preparing to study the word, but more so he, he attacked me. And so that's why I know it's going to be something really good. Whether, whether it's something you've heard before or haven't heard, but I just know it's going to be something good. Because when the enemy starts to come and starts to harass you, you know something's good is going to happen. Amen. Amen. And I was literally to a point where um, I couldn't stand up. Um, I was, you know, just ill feeling in my stomach and, and all these other things. And, and I thought, Lord, I, I got to push through this thing. And he started just showing me in his word that you need to start saying what you're about to teach. And you'll see, and you'll overcome. Amen. So in Ephesians chapter, uh, chapter 1, I just want to start where we normally start at other times. I want to start with the Ephesians prayers because that's real kick, real, real, uh, real uh, important for us to get going with. It says in verse, um, we'll start in verse 15, Wherefore, I also, after I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and love unto all the saints, cease not to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the spirit of wisdom in revelation and in knowledge of him. Anybody not want that? Yeah. I want every bit of it. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of his glory and inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. And have put all things, where? Under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. Amen. Yeah. <clears throat> Daily, we should be starting out our day praying this prayer. Amen. That you and you yourself, that you'll be encouraged, that your eyes will be enlightened. That your eyes will be enlightened, that you will know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of his glory. We can be so distracted with everything that's going on right now. The news media, uh, just the world in general, uh, all the activity that's happening. We can be so distracted and take our eyes totally focused off of God. Yes. But if you will get into uh, praying this prayer on a daily basis... I believe it would enlighten you and redirect you to the point where you, you will bring your eyes back on what is the Lord doing. Amen? Amen? And that your eyes will be open and have an understanding and enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what is the riches of his glory of inheritance in the state. saints and what is the exceeding greatness of his power towards us. God's power still reigns. Amen? 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 It doesn't matter what's going on in this nation right now. It doesn't, it, it doesn't matter all the distractions that are going on. God's power still reigns. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him in his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all principality and power, and might and dominion and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And we can jump over to the prayer on Ephesians chapter 3. It says, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. Where does Christ dwell? How does Christ dwell in your hearts? By faith. That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height. And I even got written in here with. 
So everything's covered. And to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you might be filled with all the fullness of God. Now unto him who is able to do what? Exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. If you're operating in the fullness of faith, God will operate in such a way that it, he will do even greater than what you can even comprehend or think. Did you get that? It says here, now unto him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. You're not shouting yet. Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask, anything you ask, or think according to the power that works in us. All that you have. All that you have. God is greater. God can fulfill even greater than what you think. Amen. Unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. Now, I was, I was telling you earlier that I want to talk about great faith tonight. And great faith is, is uh, <clears throat> again, it is identified a couple times in the Bible. But I want to turn first to Mark chapter 11. All of you know the scripture, and, uh, scripture sections that we're going to read. But I think it's real key to do, do this as a jumping off point. Before we get into to the uh, scriptures associated with great faith, I'm gonna, I've got a lot of scriptures to share with you. I'm trying to do my best to get them all in. And if I miss anything, it's okay. Uh, amen. amen. Hallelujah. Mark chapter 11, just in verse 22, it says, Have faith in God. We believe right now. The word says, have faith in God. And like I said, we can leave right now. What's the word say? It says, have faith in God. Does it have faith in the government? No. Have, have faith in your finances, your bank account? No. It says, have faith in God. No other thing but God. Have faith in God. The Bible also interprets this in a certain study that it talks about have the God kind of faith. We know that. We've heard that. We've studied it. But the most important thing is understanding that we have to have faith in God. Too often we wake up in the morning and we get ready to go to our workplace and, and get prepared to uh, you know, take on the challenges of the day. And the last thing we think about is what's God got to do with it? That's exactly right. God has everything to do with it. Amen. And we need to start separating ourselves. You know, if we're going to do what our pastor has instructed us to do in the last few weeks about building up our faith, I know I haven't arrived. I haven't gotten where I want to be, but I want to get to the point where it's when I wake up every day, the first thing I do think about is, where is my faith level today? What am I believing you for, God? Amen. Am I having what I'm saying? That's where I want to be. I don't want to even, even think and, and, and give an opportunity to allow doubt to come in whatsoever. If I've confessed it off my lips, I believe it, and that settles it. That's where I want to be. As we've been instructed, if our faith level is not at that point in the coming days, it's going to be a struggle. Amen. We've been told it's going to be a struggle. So whose choice is it? It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. It's yours. Verse 22. Have faith in God. Verse 23. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto the mountain, Be thou removed, 
and be thou cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but shall believe that those things which he saith shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he says. We all know there's a lot of information just in that scripture text in verse 23. But what God, I believe, was attempting to do, and I went back and I found a book um, that Dr. Hagen wrote, and I found the definition that was there, and I found this. It says that the God kind of faith, the kind in which a man believes, is the kind that which a man believes in his heart. Number two, he says with his mouth what he believes in his heart. You see, Sometimes we'll get up in the morning and we'll believe in our heart and we don't say nothing. But the God kind of faith is the kind in which a man believes in his heart and then secondly says with his mouth what he believes in his heart. Yeah. Where do we need to get to? We need to get to the point where we are not only believing in our heart, but yes, we are saying with our mouth what we believe in our heart. And then, thirdly, it will come to pass. So there's a criteria. Number one, believe in your heart. Can it stop there? It can stop right there, but nothing's going to happen other than you just believed in your heart. Amen? But secondly, believe in your heart and say with your mouth what you believe in your heart. So I ask you right now, think about it for a minute. You don't have to tell me. But what do you believe in your heart? And what have you been saying from your mouth? I have been believing certain things, but I don't recall, the Lord instructed me earlier, but I don't recall saying anything out of my mouth. My wife and I have been believing for some certain things, and we're supernaturally, we've seen some uh, debts canceled, and we've you know paid off some bills earlier than we expected, and getting to that point of, yes, we have bills, um, you know, it's one of those things we have, but we're working on becoming debt free, amen? We're working on that. Now, now, but one of the things that I re recognized as I was studying through this earlier today is that, yeah, I've been believing in my heart. Yes, Lord, I've been believing. I've been saying this. I, I have faith in God. I'm believing in my heart. But then he said, what are you saying? Yes, amen. And I, I was like, oh, what do you mean? I'm, I'm saying it right now. He said, no, no, what are you saying? What you're believing in your heart, that's great. It's in there. It's kind of like that Prego spaghetti sauce. It's in there, right? Is it, they still have Prego spaghetti sauce, Miss Frank? I don't, yeah. I don't remember. But, it, but so I'm believing in my heart and it's in there, but what have I said? So when the Lord kind of corrected me on that, immediately I started saying a whole bunch of stuff. And one of those things I started saying was how the enemy was attacking me with, with trying to attack me with illness. I started turning around with what the word says, amen, and started applying it right then. And all of a sudden, you know what happened? I started recovering. Amen. Isn't that amazing? How simple God's word is. And he just simply tells us, to believe in your heart and confess it with your mouth. Amen. Confess what's in your heart. Believe it. Believe it and let it. And guess what? It will come to pass. Amen. But when we talk about Mark 11, 23 and 24, and we've studied, we hear about it, there's something very simple about this that I got really excited about early. And it's this simple. Faith is so simple, it's beyond our own comprehension. I'll say it again. Faith is so simple it's beyond our own comprehension. So, Mr. Booty, not to put you on the spot, but when were you saved? When I was asked when I was saved, I used to say October 1983. When were you saved? 
What were you saying? I know you have the right answer. Right now, Amen. Glory to God. The truth of the matter is that every one of us were saved, as Brother Bill said, when Jesus Christ, over 2,000 years ago, died on the cross. That's when we were saved. All we do when we say that I was saved in October of 1983 or September 20th at 9 a.m. in the morning or this or that or whatever, all we're saying is this. Salvation became reality and you began, you, you began to believe it and confess it at that time. The truth is you were saved 2,000 years ago. Amen? Get that? The truth is, you were saved 2,000 years ago. So great, it's great to have that date. I'm, I'm not belittling the date, but most important for you to recognize is that's how simple faith is. Whatever it is you're believing God for, based on according to His Word, it's yours right there. Actually, it's available or came available to you before you even knew it. I didn't know about salvation. Until I heard a message about it. But it was already taken care of for me. Do you get that? It was taken care of for me. So the same with everything we do as we operate in faith. Whatever you're believing God for. It's the same basic principle. That's how simple faith is. Amen. Salvation becomes reality when you believe it. And then you confess it. But salvation already existed. It was already yours. Amen? Glory to God. Hallelujah. God, you're so good. Now, if you would, you can turn with me to, uh, actually, let's go to Mark chapter 5. Mark chapter 5. Glory to God. We know that Hebrews 11 one says, And now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. In the NIV version of that, it says, Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. And of course, we also know that faith pleases God. In Hebrews 11.6, Without faith, it's impossible. Without faith, it's impossible. Without faith, it's impossible. To please God. Because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So without faith, it's impossible to please him. Hallelujah. We go here in uh, Mark chapter 5. We know this uh, text as well. It's about the woman with the issue of blood. <coughs> Starting in verse 25 or 24. Um, and 24, Jesus went with him, and much people followed him and thronged him. And a certain woman, which had an issue of blood 12 years, and had suffered many things and many physicians, and had spent all that she had, and was nothing better, but rather grew worse. When she had heard of Jesus, came in, pressed behind, and touched his garment. For she said, If I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway the fountain of her blood was dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. And Jesus, immediately knowing in him that virtue had gone out of him, and turned about in the press, and said, Who touched my clothes? And his disciples said unto him, Thou seest the multitude thronging thee, and saith thou who touched me. <clears throat> and he looked around about to see her that had done this thing. But the woman, fearing and trembling, knowing what was done in her, came and fell down before him, and told him all the truth. And he said unto her, Daughter, thy faith has made thee whole. So her faith made thee whole, but in this, in this particular scenario, one of the things the Lord showed me was this. She didn't need to touch 
she didn't need Jesus to touch her. All she needed to do was to touch him. Whatever your circumstances are today, all you need to do is reach out and touch Jesus. He's there. He's available to you daily. But you need to do it. See, some people would be offended today. I'm sure Pastor could attest to this. You know, if they came to the church here and Pastor, in this case, Pastor's not here, but if he's normally here and they came to the church here and they were just seeking him to come up and I, I want to go so Pastor can lay hands on me. And if Pastor decided according to, based on the way we read the scripture right here, Pastor might say, well, not today. All you need is to reach out and touch Jesus. What would happen to most of the church? They go out of here and start talking about pastor because he won't, he won't lay hands on me. He doesn't have time. Amen? But the truth is, it's up to us to build up that level of faith to acknowledge the fact, just like the woman with the issue of blood, we need to get that level of faith built up to the point, well, it doesn't matter who I'm, who's out there. It doesn't matter if pastor's there or Brother Bill or whoever's up there ministering. It doesn't matter who they are. My healing should come by me just knowing that, hey, Jesus is here. He's here in this presence right now. It is good. It's a, it's a good opportunity for, you know, to be able to lay hands on people naturally, yes. But the point of the matter is, is when we get, as we, as we continue to grow here in, in these days to come, we're going to have to be operating in our faith. Believe in God. You know, the pastor may not be available. Those who you know at the church may not be available. So it's going to be dependent on what you have capability of doing. And you should be, what they say, learned up. Amen? You should be skilled up, educated, ready, knowing that, hey, all I've got to do is just get close. You know what? If I could just get in the shadow. Amen? Have you ever been places? I know I have. I'm sure these guys have been places where the anointing was so strong that you didn't even have to get near anybody, that you just fall out in the presence. Amen? That's where we're headed. As Pastor said, we got some great and mighty things getting ready to take place here. I think that's some of it. The anointing of God will be so strong that probably most of us couldn't even stand to sit in a chair like you're sitting in it right now. You probably end up falling prostrate on the ground because it's so strong. And Jesus will move and operate. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Go over to Matthew. Now we'll get into the great faith. This is what I want you to accomplish tonight. Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8, <clears throat> in verse 5. All of you know this is about the Roman centurion that came to Jesus. It says in verse 5, And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him a centurion, beseeching him. Well, first of all, th this Roman centurion, do you know... Um, was this centurion, does anybody know, this, was this centurion a, a Jew or a Gentile? Anybody? Just to clarify. I studied it through and found out that it is believed that this Roman soldier, believe it or not, was a Gentile. So that, that's key. It's hard to believe, but it's key. And when Jesus was entered into Capernaum, there came unto him, centurion beseeching him and saying Lord my servant lieth at home sick of palsy grievously tormented and Jesus said unto him I will come and heal him immediately Jesus said I will come and heal him if that was today guess who would else show up at the house all the rest of the family would be there too 
because he said, hey, Jesus will come, Jesus is coming, and he heal, and he's going to heal, everybody will show up. Amen? Everybody would. Jesus said unto him, I will come and heal him. And the centurion asked and said, Lord, I am not worthy thou shouldst come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. Key. Speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed. For I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh, and to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. This is one text that Jesus was described in the Bible where Jesus indicated an individual having great faith. Why did he have great faith? <clears throat> He's identified as having great faith. Here's a man who knew what authority is about. This Roman officer knew that Jesus had such authority that he believed his request for the healing of a servant would be given him without the need for the Lord Jesus to personally come. But only needed to say the word. Are you in a position tonight, and are you ready tonight to just hear the word and believe God? Amen? Now I'll jump over to the Canaanite woman on verse uh, Matthew 15. This is the other text where great faith came from Jesus' lips. <clears throat> Again, the Canaanite woman we know is a Gentile. Who did Jesus come for during this time? He came for the Jews. Amen? That's who he came for. Verse 21, it says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coast of Tyre and Sidon. And, be, and behold, a woman of came and came out of the same coast and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. Interestingly enough, this Canaanite woman identified him as the son of David, which is also known to, for us as to be what? Jewish king. She recognized him as a Jewish king. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil, but he answered her not a word, and his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away, for she crieth after us. But he answered and said, I am not sent, but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Basically, I have come for the people of Israel. I haven't come for you. Now, if you were in this situation, what would you think if you were on the receiving end? She's come to him believing, already indicated here, that she, he is the son of David. But yet, he's kind of saying, I'm not sent but unto the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Meaning, I have come here for the people of Israel. I believe it was a test. Because he says, then, then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me. But he answered and said, it is not meat to take the children's bread and to cast it to the dogs. Well, in this des description, the children's bread was basically the Jewish people, ident identification to the Jewish people, and the bread was Jesus' ability to heal and cast out demons, and the dogs were the Gentiles. That was the identification. But the bread, again, was almighty power to heal. And, as indicated, it says, And she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Well, if we step back, 
yet he said, and she said, Truth, Lord, yet the dogs eat of the crumbs which fall from the master's table. Whatever is left over is good enough for me. I'll say it again. Whatever she said, whatever is left over, the crumb. Yes, you may be here for those, those Jews, but I'm here. And I believe, I believe I know who you are. And whatever's left over will be good enough for me. I have faith to believe if I lap up the crumbs. Amen? Amen. She's satisfied to eat the crumbs. And ultimately, Jesus was impressed with her faith. Then Jesus said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Now again, she did nothing but come to him. She wasn't looking for somebody to lay hands on her. It was just a matter of operating and believing him for who she heard he was. Amen? Who she heard he was. Hallelujah. God is so good. He is just so good. In this text that we have here, I wrote a, wrote a note out. So both came asking Jesus to heal and set free people they deeply cared about. They didn't come to get something for themselves. They came to see others set free. Their faith used to help others know, their faith was used to help others know and experience God's power. When you start seeing God's heart bless, forgive, heal, and set free those who are bound, struggling, and defeated in life, you will also have the very same type of great faith that Jesus was amazed by and marveled at. I know that was a lot. Even my tongue got twisted. When you start seeing God's heart to bless, forgive, heal, set free those who are bound, struggling, defeated in life, you will also have the very same type of great faith that Jesus was amazed by and marveled at. Hallelujah. And just in wrapping up here, I just want to go over a few topics here. Um, in this season that we're in, we need to develop, obviously, our faith for it to be great, just like these two. <clears throat> and I have written down a few principles here with some guidance that I believe will help you. So you can make some notes if you want or get the CD or whatever. The things to remember are this. Number one, faith can grow. Amen. Faith can grow. Romans 10, 17 says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So therefore, our faith will grow by what? Studying and praying and, and reading the word of God daily. Number two, faith can be measured. Romans 12, 3 says God has dealt to every person the measure of faith. So it can be measured. We've all been given a measure of faith. Amen? Amen? Hallelujah. Number three, faith will change you if you allow it. But faith will change you. Hebrews 11, 6, without faith, it is impossible to please God. Impossible to please God. Number four, of course we know this one, faith will save you. Faith will save you. Ephesians 2.8 For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Amen. Number five. Faith will define you. Take the shield of faith. Ephesians 6.16 Take the shield of faith, which is what? The spoken word. Enabling you to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. 
Faith will define you. Faith will provide for you. Ephesians 3.20, now unto him who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine according to his power that is work, working in us. Number seven, faith will, what I call, cement you. John 5, 15, 7, if you abide in him or if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask what you desire and it, it shall be done unto you. And number eight, faith will cause your prayers to work. Faith will cause your prayers to work. 1 John 5, 14, now this is the confidence we have in him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. <clears throat> Ultimately, great faith comes by understanding and recognizing that he is the author and the finisher of our faith. Amen. Glory to God. God is so good. Father, we thank you again for this evening. We thank you, Father, for this word. Father, it's been simple, but I believe, Lord, that it will uh, open up some new avenues for folks to study and to seek after. Father, we have our faith in you tonight. We're believing you for some mighty, mighty things. And we thank you, Father, for what you're doing in our lives. Father, that you're growing us in your word. And Father, that we're uh, operating in things that uh, we could never imagine years been from years past and we thank you father for what you're doing here at rlc father the increase of people coming from various areas and thank you father for the growth in our pastor father the seeking uh, we just so desire to seek you more than ever before and i thank you father for that father right now i just ask you that you just lift up each and every one that's within the sound of my voice this time I thank you, Lord, that they will just, oh, Father, just seek after you and acknowledge that you are mighty in their life. You're a God that's more than enough. You're a healer, you're a deliverer, you're a provider, Father. Father, I just thank you again so very, very much. For all that you're doing in this place. Holy Spirit, have your way here. Father, we lift up our pastor to you. We continue to and undergird him with strength. And Father, we raise his arms up. We know that uh, he has gone through a uh, physical procedure. But Father, we know that in the spirit, he is healthy and whole from the top of his head to the tip of his toes. We praise you for the supernatural healing manifestation taking place in his body right now. And he is strengthened and moving forward. We thank you for it now. In Jesus' name, amen. Father, we thank you again for this night. We thank you, Father, for those that are in attendance. If there's anybody here tonight that, that uh, doesn't know the Jesus we've been talking about, we encourage you right now to open your hearts up to receive him. We're here to pray with you, set our faith with you. And if you have any special needs tonight, we're available to also pray for you. healing in your body. God is with us. He's on our side. Amen. Glory to God. Anybody have any needs? Any news updates that we need to know about? Appreciate y'all being here tonight and continue to keep Pastor lifted up. And you are dismissed.